Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Osteoporosis Canada's webinar, How to Find and Critically Evaluate Health and Health Information on the Web, Best Practices and Red Flags. Before we begin today's webinar, Osteoporosis Canada acknowledges the land that our offices located in Toronto are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. My name is Tanya Long, Senior Manager, National Education at Osteoporosis Canada, and I will be your moderator today. This webinar is presented in partnership with Copen, Osteoporosis Canada's Canadian Osteoporosis Patient Network. Copen is the patient arm of Osteoporosis Canada, a national network of people living with osteoporosis. It represents their interests within Canada's program, sorry, within Osteoporosis Canada's programs and activities, including research, advocacy, and education. To sign up free of charge, go to osteoporosis.ca forward slash C-O-P-N. This webinar will provide general information about using the internet for health information. It is not intended as individualized health advice. Please note, if you have questions during the webinar, you can enter the questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar within the time available. Next slide, please. Vera Kranikoff is a PhD candidate at the School of Information Studies at McGill University. She is also a research embedded information specialist in the Department of Family Medicine at McGill. She is passionate about information literacy, the value of information, collaboration, community, and patient engagement. Virginie Paquette holds a master's degree in information science from l'Université de Montréal. After working in primary healthcare research, she joined the university as a health librarian. She is interested in how scientific information is disseminated and in making it easier for everyone to find and understand. Many of us turn to the internet to find answers to our questions about our health. Some of the information we find is reliable, some is not. How do we tell the difference? Vera and Virginie will help us understand how to find, evaluate, and use that information. Vera and Virginie, over to you. Great, thank you so much for joining us today. And yeah, Virginie and I will have the great pleasure to talk about a topic that we're really passionate about. So this is really the objectives for today is that we will share some best practices. And we're, as Tanya mentioned, we are trained as librarians, not health professionals. So the focus will really be on information. So we'll share best practices on how to search critically evaluate and use or share the health information that we find on the internet. So we all know, uh, well, and I think it's a shared experience at this point that we look for health information online. And maybe as I keep talking, if you could share in the chat box, some of your ways, you know, if they're specific websites or newsletters, sources that you trust, and go back to just to give us an idea of what your experience with online health information is. In the meantime, I will also introduce you to our entire team. So Virginie and I are two members of a team from McGill University. Some of us are from family medicine, some are from School of Information Studies, which is really, it's just a new, um, we could say an updated name for library school. So it's the department that trains librarians. And together we found 
that after, after we did a lot of research with health professionals trying to understand how they look for health information and whether the patients actually benefit from it. And at some point we said, well, hold on a second. With the internet, with the explosion, we could say, of health information we can find online, everybody is looking for health information. So we started studying it and we did a very large systematic literature review where we pulled together different studies on health information and how regular people, the public, uses health information that they find online. And what we found was that people definitely go turn to the internet to find health information because they want to be more involved in their own healthcare. Also, often they want to discuss their particular situation with healthcare professionals. So often we will go on the internet before seeing our doctor, for example, to prepare our questions and to find out some more information. And also people look for information to support relatives or friends. So that's very common where we will be looking for someone else. We know that using health information is related to increased participation in our own healthcare and decision-making related to our health. People generally feel more empowered and there is evidence of improved health outcomes that are connected to health information literacy and using health information. However, there are also some negative outcomes and I would suspect that some of you um, will recognize some of them, that this will resonate. There's definitely increased worry. I remember in one of our research studies, I conducted interviews with regular people who look for health information on the internet. And I will always remember this woman who said, if you look long enough, it will tell you you have cancer. So this is kind of the experience that I think if we search long enough for symptoms at some point, the internet will show us something scary that will increase our worry. There is also evidence of having tension between family members. So for example, I found something on the internet, let's say as a young mother, I found something that goes against what my mother believed about child's health and development. So there could be tensions and there could also be tensions with a health professional. So it's not always family members, but there could be tensions. For example, if I come, this is actually another anecdote from the interviews that I conducted that this woman just said, I never bring it up with my doctor because my doctor says, if it's not, if it's from the internet, I don't want to hear about it. So we know that there are tensions and also sometimes people may ignore actually a health problem or not ask for help as a result of the information that they found online. So when we identified kind of the the negative outcomes, the areas that were complicated or complex, we developed this website that's called the Online Health Information Aid. And we organized it really in the three main phases, we could say, of how we interact with health information. So there is how to search. And as librarians, information scientists, we will share with you some tips on how to search. The next step is how to evaluate. So once you find the information, it's to be able to think about it critically, because as we know, while there's a lot of information on the internet, the quality varies. And there's definitely, um, well, there's reliable information, unreliable information, and sometimes even information that's intended to be harmful. And then finally, help you use. So this um, could be how to implement changes in your own behavior or how you manage your health your health or how to help a family member or even how to discuss it with a health professional. So this is really how we structured today's presentation. And first we'll go to help you search that Virginie will present. So this so, is... When we think um, about searching on the internet, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is Google. Um, so 
on this first section on, on our website, we present what is Google. So as some of you may know, Google is not a web browser. It's not exactly a website. It's kind of a website, but it's called what we call a search engine. So it's something that search for other websites. So you use keywords to try to get the information you're looking for. And you can go to the next slide, Vera. And um, when you go on Google, you probably all already realize that you just type in some things and usually it works, you get what you want. And that's because Google has a very refined algorithm, which we don't really know how it works, but it likes to like, it, it knows how you think and it brings you back results that are most of the time what you want. Um, and since it adapts to everyone's way of searching, it also means that if two exact same, two person make the exact same uh, search in, a, in, in Google like search bar, they won't get the same result. And in fact, um, I have Google at work and I have Google at home. And even then I don't have the same results because I don't do exactly the same kind of research at those places. So I don't have exactly the same results. So there, you can do really like complicated research in Google. It's way easier to have results with like just a few keywords and look at the first pages of results. One trick that can be useful is to use quotation marks. So if you think that you have too much results that they're not exactly relevant, you can look for an expression. That's what quotation marks are used for. And it also works to force Google to use a keyword that he ignored. Um, for example, um, if I'm looking uh, for restaurants in Montreal and I type in restaurant Montreal and I usually don't look for restaurant in Montreal, I look for restaurant in Toronto, Google might in your Montreal you will be like, nah, you don't look for Montreal usually. So if I put Montreal in quotation marks, it will force him to acknowledge that I want Montreal. So that's a really useful trick. Uh, one thing to be aware of when you search in Google is that usually the first results are paid ads. So it's not necessarily wrong. Some of these ads are perfectly trustworthy information sources, but Sometimes it's just corporations that have money. So when you look at the first results, you have to be careful. Just think, is it really what I want to see? Or I want to go lower on the search results to see some results that are not paid for. So you just have to be careful with it. And you have like an example of what it looks like. And I think now Vera will talk to you about evaluating the information you find when you Google stuff. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Virginie. So this is, yeah, we talked to you about the ads and sponsored information, just to raise your awareness that some of the information that we find on the internet is there for commercial reasons. Um, that whoever the author is, their motive is really to sell and not necessarily to help you or to help you, but by also making profit. So it's just a kind of a piece of the puzzle to keep in mind when you find information online. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. so this is just to show you that here. Usually it is marked with ad, but not always. So now we go to help you evaluate or how to know what to trust. And it's really, I think, the longer we have the internet with us, the more complex it becomes just because there's so much information. It's so easy to put content on the internet that kind of there's a lot, there's a lot of good, but there's also a lot of noise. And what we will present today is how to be critical about how to be able to filter out reliable sources from the noise. And also the approach that Virginie and I have that we want to help you raise red flags 
that it's not necessarily, we don't see ourselves here telling you what's right or what's wrong, but it's really how to develop a more critical approach towards what you find. Um, so first of all, there are different kinds of search results. The way that Virginie talked about that there's the web browser, the search engine, and then the websites, there are also different types of websites. So it could be an organizational website, for example, Osteoporosis Canada. It could also be a personal website. So I can be um, a family doctor who creates a website or a blog to share information. I could be a librarian doing the same, or I could also just be a regular person sharing my experience or sharing information for other motives. And then there are, of course, social forums. So these are places where parents or patients could exchange information. Um, many of the social forums happen now on social media. So there will be Facebook groups where people share their lived experience. So then to evaluate yourself, and as I always say, is pretend that you're a journalist and you need to think about the five W's. So the who, the what, where, why, and when. So this is kind of one of our tricks for you to take away from today is to think about these five questions when you encounter information. And of course, this is when you encounter information on the internet, but it also could be applicable to any type of information, whether it's in print, in the newspaper, on the radio, or even in conversation. These are just questions to help you be more critical about the information you encounter. So first of all is the who. Who is the author? Who is the sponsor of the website? Who is behind this information? And also, is it easy to tell? So for example, if you can't find who the author is easily, that could be already a red flag because usually a reliable website that provides reliable information will be very transparent about who they are, what their credentials are, uh, sometimes even like what their editorial process is. And you can usually find it in the About Us section. Um, and my suggestion also would be, is there a way to contact the authors? Because once again, if you don't know who they are, there's no way to contact them. It could be a potential red flag. And just to also give you an example that there are these endings of websites that we see. So it could be a .gov, .edu, .org, .com. And you could use them to help you decide on the source, but they're not always reliable. So .gov is usually, it all it means that the website is hosted by a government organization. Dot edu usually means that it's an educational, uh, for example, a university. But that also, it's applied differently in Canada and in the US. So it's not necessarily a rule that always applies consistently across websites. Dot org usually means that it's a non-for-profit organization in contrast to dot com that's commercial. So this is just to kind of decipher these URL endings for you. And I'm sure you're familiar that sometimes it's also .ca, but all that really tells you is that the website is registered in Canada. So it doesn't speak to the reliability of the source. It just tells you its geographical location. So after who, we go to what. What information is presented? Are we talking, are these facts? Um, opinions, you know, is it based on experience? What are the values that are behind this? And of course, for health information, it should be factual or objective, and it should be easy to verify whether it's based on research evidence or not. Opinions, it's also, I by no means, you know, this is not to say that opinions are not valid or experience, for example, pa patient ex lived experience of the disease is very, well, valuable and important and valid. But just, it's just important to know which one it is. When you face it, is it an opinion or is it a fact? 
and ask yourself when it is opinions, whose opinions, and do you trust that source? Now we go to where is the discourse coming from? So is it scientific, uh, based on research evidence? Is it just journalism? Or I, I don't want to say just journalism, but that it comes from the media. This is a journalist, maybe even a scientific journalist who is writing it, but not necessarily a researcher. Once again, is it opinion? Is it experience? And ask yourself, are the authors talking about facts, values, opinions? Because all it's all interrelated and sometimes it's difficult to decipher which one it is. But once again, it's just a way for you to raise red flags. Why is this website there? Who is it for? What is its purpose? And this brings us some websites provide consumer health information. So it's really they're designed, they're written with the general public in mind. Some websites are more for health professionals. So for example, the language that is used will be different. And sometimes it could increase our worry because we don't necessarily understand the language or the concepts behind it. The purpose sometimes is advertising. So this is going back to what Virginie was showing you about ads and sponsored information. Um, and then also funding. How is it funded? Who is behind this? When was the website updated? So usually websites, um, put at the bottom of the website the date when the content was updated or revised. And of course, because we're talking about health and health research um, is evolving all the time, we, we would like to read the most up-to-date information. Just, um, I'm not very familiar with osteoporosis research, but I'm sure it has changed a lot in the past 10 years. So when you're reading something, like, in a way, not to say that older information is not valid, because sometimes it still is, but just to be aware of when this information, this website is from. And then these are just some examples, um, I would say maybe explicit red flags of when to proceed with cautious. So advertising of pharmaceutical drugs, herbs, dietary supplements, because once again, they're primary motive may be to make a profit rather uh, than educate. Also, when we're talking about um, non-toxic, holistic, or miraculous treatments, this is another moment when you go back to your five questions and maybe think about what you encounter more critically. Um, statements like everyone should take this or 100% effective once again, proceed with caution. If there is also, for example, if you come across a website that says that it's based on research evidence, but there are no references to the actual research studies, another red flag, because in a way, there's no really good reason not to reference where the information is coming from if they're saying that it comes from research, that it's evidence-based. Sites without a clear or transparent editorial process, um, because once again, if it is a reliable source, they will be very proud to tell you that they have an editorial board with health professionals or scientific writers, and that they vet the information that goes online. And personal websites, even if it is a doctor, once again, you know, this could be a place of a personal opinion. And these are just some examples. So when I did some tests for today, looking for Osteoporosis Canada, I'm not sure why, but the first um, hit or the first result that came up is from Al Algae Curl to overcome severe osteoporosis. So this is just to be aware that for some reason in the search engine, an ad came above Osteoporosis Canada. And yet here's an example to show you. So this is a website called Very Well. 
And when I went here, we will hold on. So first of all, it shows us that there is an about us section. Oh, oh, you know, hold on. I will try, we'll see if this works. And if it brings me, oh no, it's not opening. Um, but just to give you, I will kind of walk, walk you through it and you can do a test by yourself after is that on this website very well, you can see, they describe their entire process of where the information comes from, how they validate it. And it's very clear, it's very explicit and it's transparent. So this is an example of what to look for. And once again, I'm not here to necessarily promote the very well website, but really to promote the process that what you should be looking for is something explicit, clear, and transparent of who is behind this information and why it is being shared with you. This is just uh, to show you visually some of the same things that I've said. It comes from IFLA or the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. So this is, this they developed this for fake news, but it really applies to online information, any information is consider the source, yet read beyond, because sometimes we will read something and stop. So read the whole story, check who the author is, um, check the supporting sources. So right, and we will come back to it. I'm sure by the end of the presentation, you may have a feeling that we're repeating ourselves sometimes, and we are in a way saying the same message in different ways. So we will come back to this idea of supporting sources and really triangulating and validating what you find to make sure that it's not this particular website is the only one across the internet who is saying this. So check the date. Also, is it a joke? You know, because sometimes, um, I mean, there is information that is shared that is meant to make you laugh or make you angry, kind of think of what's, what's behind it because information can definitely trigger an emotional response. And sometimes that's intentional. Um, check your biases. So we, you know, we all have our biases and confirmation bias is definitely one that applies to you know, all of us. And sometimes I give a similar session in my daughter's school and I always I show them a picture of beautiful chocolate cake and say you know if the association of pastry makers tells you chocolate is good for your health and you love chocolate you will be more likely to believe that kind of information so kind of be aware of your own biases specifically the confirmation bias and ask the experts so it could be in specific to information, it could be a librarian, but also check, um, you could check with health professionals or even people in your social networks that maybe have um, training in health um, or osteoporosis specifically. So Virginie, I pass to you the baton. So I think it's the, it's the, I'm doing the natural follow-up with the fake news is that when we find information, we want to share it. We want to use it. So there are two ways to use it. When you use information, first, you want to share it like with your doctor, probably. You're probably looking for health information regarding your own health. So we have a small section on our website to help you discuss the information you found with your doctor. Because many patients have told us, see, some doctors are really not receptive to information found on the internet. So it's a good thing to prepare yourself before seeing your doctor. So we propose some resources to help you prepare the conversation so that when you talk with your doctor or any health specialist, it could be a, a nurse or a therapist, uh, at least you're prepared and you show that you've made real research, you thought about the credibility of your source and its trustworthiness. 
So we offer a few resources on, on that to help you prepare the discussion. And now I'm going to share what we, it's a national campaign called Check First, Share After. So I'm going to share tips from them. And I think we have the website later in our slides. Um, so when we share, obviously when we find information that we find interesting, we want to share it. Um, but we think it's really important to check the fact first and then share because sharing bad information can cause real harm. It can be dangerous, especially with health information. And it can, it can cause harm in two different ways. It can cause harm regarding your health, but it can also cause harm regarding your mental health because things can escalate quickly on the internet and you don't want to be squished in a fight. It's not, uh, it's not fun for anyone. So we have a few tricks that we suggest um, before sharing the information. And the first one that's, in my opinion, the most important is to read the publication from beginning to end. So if you don't have the time to read it all completely, then the rule is you don't share. That's my rule. You don't have the time, you don't share. So if you think it's interesting and you want to share it with someone, wait until you have the time to read it. Um, pause. So this one is when something makes you react strongly. It makes you angry. It makes you really happy. Then maybe there's something fishy. So take a break, think about it, and come back to it later. And if you still think it's a good idea to share it, then share it. But it's always a good idea to take a break. Vera talked about that, but check the source. So if it's too good or it makes you angry, maybe the source wants you to feel very joyful or very angry. So just check where it comes from and ask, use your critical sense that you developed in the last few uh, slides with Vera and ask yourself who wrote this, what's their intention and be extra careful with certain topics. Um, sometimes topics are like dear to our arts and we want the information to be true. And then we have to be extra careful because that's what we call our own biases. So we have to be aware of them and just take them into account and use the other tips to take a step back. And if it's still worth sharing, then we can do it later. And that's the librarian one. <laughs> we like to do this, this, this funny, uh, <laughs> this funny gesture. So if um, you're not sure if you should share some information, well, take a look. Is there other people talking about it? And if you can find at least three different source, major sources that talk about it, then it's probably safe to share. But if you can find anyone else talking about it, then probably that it's not something worthy to share, or at least with the, without a fair warning that you've only seen that one time and that it's not probably not very perfect information, but you're excited anyways and you're sharing it. So I'm going to let Vera finish that talk. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Virginie. And also just to add to this idea of the triangle is try to look for different sources because in a way that's even more valuable if you've consulted three different, you know, maybe one is, I don't know, like, uh, for example, comes from Public Health Canada, one is from Osteoporosis Canada, and then there is, I don't know, maybe a doctor's personal website that references new scientific studies related to osteoporosis. So there are different types of websites, and if they all agree, that would signal to you that it is, it's more likely to be reliable. Oh, sorry, wrong direction. So just to direct you uh, quickly that we also have a section of the website that's called useful websites. We recognize that, yes, it's when we have time, it's good to, to learn, learn new skills and become more critical. But sometimes we also just want a list of reliable sources to go to. So this is when you, if you visit our website under useful websites, that's what you will find. 
Um, I also wanted to share this with you. Um, it's the Check Then Share website. There are different videos, there are different tools and resources that are fun and interactive that you could go and see. But what they also have is that they have a Google search box integrated into their website. So if you go to check then share, you could type in your questions in this box and do a search and it almost pre-filters it for you. It will search only in information sources that, that were vetted as reliable. I also wanted to bring your attention to libraries. So usually um, hospitals will have libraries. And I realized at some point, well, I, I didn't even know that uh, hospital libraries existed. And I think many people do not know. I mean, this is more common for hospitals that are affiliated with universities, but it, they do exist. And often they will even have a section specific to patient information. So once again, they will have a whole collection of resources that is written in a way where people will like, like me and maybe some of you who do not have medical training will understand. So this is just, so you know that they exist and you could check in your area or maybe even in the hospital you, that you've been to before that they, there is a library and you can often go to the librarian and ask them to help you search for information related to your condition or your question. This is, I wanted to bring this up just once again, so you know that it's there if you want to go further. So for example, you've heard um, something on the radio that discussed a certain research study, you could go to PubMed. PubMed is a database that collects resumes or summaries of health research. So you will not be, sometimes you will be able, but not in all cases, you may not have access to the entire article, but at least you could read the summary. So this is a place where you can go and search for summaries of, well, like evidence-based information related to health. These are just to leave you with our, well, some of them are our resources. The first one is our website, Ohio, that we used for this presentation today. There's the check first, share after. Understanding Research is another website that I was involved in where we actually try to explain and demystify some of the more scientific concepts. So for example, if you do want to go further and you go to PubMed and you find a summary of the article and maybe you even find the full text of an article describing certain research study that you're interested in, you could use the Understanding Research website um, to understand, well, like what is a quantitative study, for example, or what are the different research methods? So that's another tool for you. And there's the deep dive, check then share. Well, deep dive is a section of the check and share website that also goes a little bit deeper into health research, what is science. It's another tool if you want to go further. This is, I will, I wanted to share this with you because it's a really great episode of a CBC show, uh, White Coat, Black Art. And it's a, the story, it's very well done. It's a very engaging story to listen to, but it really shows what could happen to health information. And this is just to give you a quick summary that there was a study that looked at the effect of dandelion root in tea on cancer cells. And it kind of took this proportion uh, as a potential cure, while in scientific terms, it was so far. There's some studies that happened in a lab, in a, in a little Petri dish, and were so far from any studies with humans. But then some 
website, um, picked it up, and then we're advertising it as a cure for cancer. So this is just, it's almost, it's a cautionary tale of what could happen and how tiny piece of scientific information could be taken out from its context and presented as shared in a way that is actually harmful. So this is, this is it for our presentation. And now uh, we will answer some of the questions that came in. And I will, I will stop sharing for now. Thank you very, very, very much, Vera and Virginie. That was a fantastic presentation. So questions. Here's one from a health professional. How do I politely reply to a patient who says, I have Googled it and found that? How does, how does the healthcare professional respond to that kind of comment from their patient? Virginie, should, I can go and then maybe you can add if I miss anything. Well, I would say, first of all, thank you so much. <laughs> I would thank you for, well, I guess wanting to, or being curious about how to engage with a patient because it's not every health professional who is interested in engaging on that level. And I think I would ask some of the questions, you know, that we shared in the presentation today is like, Google is only a search engine. It's a tool that helps you search for information and you could find reliable information, high quality information with Google's help. But there's also a lot of unreliable and potentially harmful information. So I would ask your patient more about the source, like where does it come from? Um, and I know there are stories where well, because pa patients really care about their health and are very involved in their condition, that often they will go, for example, to PubMed and actually print out the articles, you know, and show it and share it with the health professionals. So I, I would say if there's time in the encounter, uh, I would maybe poke, you know, and ask more questions about where the information is coming from. And maybe they could even print it out and show it to you at the next visit, but we do recognize that for sure it takes it takes time. Yeah. Um, I, I would add that as an health professional, I suppose that you are like worried about what's in the mind of your patient. So if your patient goes on Google and search for something, it's probably because he's worried. So I would also probably try to know what's what's the matter on under that and try to go to What's the real problem with that? I think here you have to be open-minded. People will do that. They will search. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, and now we have another question. Um, so one questioner said that they sometimes get information, they read abstracts from National Institutes of Health from other countries. Um, do either of you want to comment on that? Um, I can make a comment from an osteoporosis Canada point of view, but you may wish to comment about it in general. Well, maybe would it, and yeah, I'd be curious, Tanya, from the osteoporosis Canada perspective, what I would say, and I think, especially now the pandemic really has, well, like highlighted also how complex health information is, but also health research. And there is definitely, mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are studies that are shared. And it's not even necessarily, I wouldn't say that it's related to the geography, you know, of where the authors come from. But there are, there are studies of varying quality. You know, it's a fact. And I think especially the pandemic showed us that the fact that everything is being done on sort of super speed, you know, and sometimes studies will be shared as preprints, which means that they haven't been peer reviewed, is to be aware that, yes, even published scientific research um, is not always reliable. And I know it's kind of, it's complex to introduce this area, this gray area, but it is the fact they're also, once again, going back to what we're saying about 
um, well, individuals or organizations who are more driven by profit, you know, there's something that's called predatory journals also. So there are journals of not, um, well, that help researchers get published fast, but don't have a very rigorous peer review process. And sometimes they're very good at making it look like a very real scientific journal, often even with the name that resembles. So it is very tricky. I would say that if you're at the level of looking at the actual studies, definitely talk to someone who is experienced and familiar with reading research studies, you know, and who give you a critical look, because in a way, the way we're critical about the information we find online, we should also be critical of research studies. And they are, um, like if someone is very interested to pursue this further, there are validated tools to assess, critically assess research as well. So that does exist. Okay, Virginie, did you want to add anything or should I just go ahead? You can go. Okay, I'll just go ahead. So Virginie, sorry. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, every, um, everything that Vera has said is, is, is right on, but I also want to say that keep in mind that different countries will have different recommendations. Um, there may be different recommendations regarding calcium and vitamin D or other, other nutrients, there might be different protocols in their management of osteoporosis, and sometimes different medications are available in, in different countries. So if, if, if you're writing from Canada, and our recommendations are, are related to our particular country and our particular demographic and studies that have been done in our country. So uh, just keep that in mind. It, it isn't even necessarily that the information that uh, another country has on their website is wrong. It's just, it's from a different country with different, with different protocols and different management strategies and, 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 and based on a different uh, demographic. So I just wanted to add that. Okay. Um, now another interesting question. Sometimes sites that um, are even perfectly reputable um, the, you, the ads appear, you know, you click on a website and whether it's PubMed or, or WebMed or Mayo and ads appear on the side of the website. Does that mean that that, that organization is benefiting? Are they getting any benefit from those ads? Virginie, would you like to start? They, it obviously means that the organization is getting money from the ads. Um, hopefully they have some kind of filter and it's just ads that they believe in that are on their website, but I think it's not always the case. Uh, so you have to be careful when you see an ad. It, it's just always like that. It's not because it's on a credible website that it's endorsed by the website. You have to always be careful with that. Vera, do you have something to add? Mm -hmm. Well, it is, it's, it's true. I saw that there is a question specific to the Mayo Clinic, which is an excellent resource. So, you know, I think, yes, the, the author of the website does benefit from the ads. So it's a way to fundraise. It doesn't necessarily, and that's a little bit, there's a lot of gray <laughs> with the internet, you know, so you could go to a website like the Mayo Clinic that is reliable. They do describe their editorial process. They do, you know, I mean, absolutely. I personally trust the Mayo Clinic, but yes, they have ads. Um, that is probably their way to sponsor the information they provide. And kind of going back to what we're saying that if you see an ad, it doesn't necessarily mean by default that it's wrong. It's just, be aware, like you've noticed that there is an ad, um, you know, so I think with some web, this is a long time ago, I think WebMD has changed since then, but there were some instances that I think specifically there is a, a self-evaluation questionnaire, perhaps for depression it was, and then, and there were definitely 
ads from pharmaceutical companies for antidepressant drugs. And then when I think it was maybe even information science researchers who dug deeper, they did find a connection. So there may be a connection, but we're not saying that there is definitely a, a connection. Once again, it's a red flag. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just the red flag to remind you to be, to be aware that there is an ad. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a number of people have asked about whether this uh, webinar will be available afterwards. And yes, it is being recorded. Uh, give it maybe 24 to 36 hours and it will be posted. And you go to osteoporosis.ca forward slash and then OC hyphen replay. And it, it will be posted so that you will have an opportunity to um, uh, view it later on if you've had to miss some of this or miss it entirely. Now, I asked earlier about how does a, uh, how does a doctor respond to a, a patient who said, well, I found this on Google. But I got a question from the reverse. In other words, a patient who has gone to a reputable site and has found information that they believe is relevant to their particular situation, how do they present that to their doctor? Yeah, that's uh, an yeah, excellent question. And I think um, I would say that if try to explain your process, you know, and maybe share with the health professional that you are aware that the information we find on the internet has, you know, varying quality, some reliable, some not. And you could maybe talk about like what you've done. And once again, I know that usually our encounters with health professionals are very limited in time. But if I think if you show that you were critical, you did consider the possibility of what's reliable, what's not reliable. Um, that hopefully the health professional will be open to you. And as the section that Virginie uh, talked about on the website, there are different tools that were developed by different organizations in different provinces of how to prepare for the encounter itself. So the one that we shared in the slides, it's from the children's hospital, but it really applies for anybody, you know, for any encounter. Yeah. And I put the link in the chat if you want to see there are different examples of like forms that you can fill in to help you prepare your visit to your doctor. So we have a few that can help. Okay, uh, um, a few people have also asked about um, um, things like good fact checking websites and algorithms for assessing bias in research, but, but my sense is that you have already answered those questions in all of the information that you've provided about other websites that one can go to, but do either of you want to add anything to that question? Um, for the fact checking, I can add uh, also in the chat a section of our website that is um, really about like debunking myths. So. Uh, since they've been especially present with COVID-19, we made a section of useful resources to help spot them. So if people want to have a look at those, we listed a few that can help with that. Uh, perfect. And just to add specific for the how to critically assess research, I'm not sure if our website has a link to something like that. Just because it's kind of it's a, a different level of your engagement, you know, with research. But whoever asks that question, I think if you go to PubMed, for example, and in the search box, type in critical assessment tools or critically assessing research, um, you will have results that are relevant to that and articles that describe different frameworks that are used for that. And we have one, in fact, that we that's coming from its former COVID website that uh, shares eight questions that you can ask yourself when you heard about a scientific study. So I put the link in the chat as well. Um, it can help, right? it's, a, it's a good tool and we, we liked it and it's specific for COVID, but it's worked for honestly any scientific research.
Well, and also just, I would, to add to that, I would say don't, when we read scientific research, don't assume that it's always right or that it's always wrong. I think just like with health information, you kind of approach it with a critical lens. Thank you very much. I think we're getting close to the time where we need to move on. And, and I believe that you both have answered the question so well and also put a lot of information into the chat that can help to answer these same questions. So thank you very much. So we'll move on to the next slide. Take a minute to screen share, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, one second. My PowerPoint is a little slow today, but here. There you go. Okay, so, uh, and again, a number of people have asked questions that were really not uh, appropriate to the subject matter of this particular webinar, but we have a lot of places where you can go uh, for information about diet and exercise and treatments. And so for tools and resources to help you manage your bone health, visit osteoporosis.ca. You can sign up for COPEN, the Canadian Osteoporosis Patient Network and you will receive a regular e-newsletter if you do so. Listen to Unbreakable, the OC podcast. You can find episodes on the website or you can stream Unbreakable through your favorite podcast provider. Check out the Know Your Risk quiz and you can also view the recorded version of this and other webinars on the OC replay webpage, which will be available in the next 24 to 36 hours. There is also a blog that contains an awful lot of good information on various aspects of osteoporosis. So next slide. And again, thank you so much to Vera Granikov and Virginie Paquette for your wonderful presentation and answers to the questions. Be sure everyone to stay connected, subscribe to the national e-newsletter, which you can do at the bottom of the OC website to get news information information and notices of upcoming webinars directly to your inbox. You can all of, also follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Until next time, thank you for joining us today, and please continue to stay well and stay connected. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.